Hi, online. I'm Phil. <laughs> I'll do a quick repeat. <laughs> My name is Phil Barbrick. Uh, I work for the Bureau of Land Management, and I'm here today to talk uh, to you a little bit about the Idaho Band of Mines team, which is a team that specializes, yes, thank you, specializes in the remediation of a band of, line, band of mine land physical safety hazard. So we'll get right to it. Uh, physical safety hazards uh, uh, made by hard rock mining have existed for as, about 41 to 43,000 years. That is if one chooses to read between the lines of archaeological reports of Africa's Inguina and Nazlat Safaha mines. I'm hoping Patrick and Terry make a liar out of me in this regard to tomorrow morning uh, when they give their presentation on Montana's Schmidt shirt mine. Looking, looking forward to that. Um, this right here is a, a photograph of, of one of the uh, old prospects uh, at the uh, Inguina mine. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think that there are other photos I could have shown you this. It's a giant open pit mine. It's, a, it's an iron mine that, would, that uh, uh, went on for literally thousands and thousands and thousands of years, if we uh, believe the archaeologist, this, this being one of the uh, initial uh, uh, places where they were digging. Couldn't find a good photograph of the Nuzlat uh, Safaha mine, so I just thought I'd show you this one. The cauldron-shaped dark line in the middle there is, uh, is where the trench was. This is a cross-section, an archaeologist's uh, cross-section of the trench. And uh, I mean, you can see on the left there with the scale, that's a one meter scale there. So the, the trench itself is about five feet deep. But they did find some artifacts uh, in there. Okay, the, the 2020 Government Accounting Office's Abandoned Hard Rock Mines uh, report stated that BLM, Forest Service, and uh, Park Service have identified at least 140,000 abandoned mine land features under their jurisdictions. Of these, about 67,000 may be physical safety hazards. Agency offic officials also estimated there could be more than 390,000 abandoned hard rock mine features on federal land that they have yet to capture in their databases. Uh, this here is a somewhat historical attempt uh, to remediate a physical safety hazard over a shaft, what the people did here. Uh, this is at a shaft uh, in Gilmore, south of Salmon, Idaho, in the Lim High Mountains. And you can tell what they did is they just took the uh, wall of the, the structure adjacent to the shaft and pulled it over the shaft. And as you look closely there, you can see that the front door is uh, open to the shaft. <laughs> So I don't know if that was their intention or not. Here's another one out of Silver City, Idaho, about uh, two hours south of Boise. And what they did here, you can see the wooden frame and then the metal pieces that are sagging into the stope, as it is here, um, are uh, where they cut out pieces of the sides of boxcars. So it, attempts made to, uh, to be able to remediate these hazards. So uh, the, the U.S. government addresses uh, abandoned mine lands physical safety hazards. Uh, making active mines safer places have, has been occurring for thousands of years, uh, albeit at a pitch much slower than most miners and their families have to date desired. Uh, though abandoned mines have existed almost as long as their active mine kin, earnest efforts by the United States government to make them safer didn't occur until long, long after a lone gray hair appeared on my head, which I uh, attribute to... Uh, sampling a bad back in a mine out of uh, Jarbage, Nevada in 1987. Uh, actually, nationwide traction was gained some 10 years earlier when U.S. Representative from Arizona, Morris Udall, sponsored SMACRA, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. The intent of this and numerous other federal and state laws of the air were to promote the remediation of AML environmental hazards. Physical hazards were pretty much ignored, other than the few handled at the local level with leftover dinner scrap funds. Uh, after listening to voices crying from the wilderness for a few decades regarding the need to remediate AML physical safety hazards, Washington acted. Although both DO, DOI and USDA had coordinated with states to clean up abandoned coal mines under SMACRA, the need for a national strategy to address abandoned hard rock mines was the driving force behind both agencies initiating AML programs in 1997. Since then, these AML programs have addressed environmental and physical safety hazards at thousands of abandoned hard rock mines. Their actions have resulted in ongoing local and nationwide contracts and agreements with the private sector and government teams to remediate AML physical safety hazards. Federal government groups specializing in the remediation of these hazards are rare indeed. Born of Washington's concern over AML physical safety hazards, the BLM established the Idaho Abandoned Mine Lands team in 2011. 
The team joined the Sawtooth National Forest Portal Posse as one of a few federal government agency units specializing in the remediation of AML physical safety hazards. Based in Salmon, Idaho, the Idaho AML team has since remediated over 900 hazards in Idaho and all surrounding states, which has barely made a dent. So while the fuss, death, injury, and tort claims are the reality of AML site visitation, Addressing the AML physical safety hazards is becoming increasingly important as exposure to AMLs increases. Reports vary, but the government published national average of reported deaths for the last 20 years is 27. The reported injuries average is 11. All experts agree that the rates are higher, especially in regards to injuries. Even where hazardous mine openings on BLM have been surrounded by sturdy eight foot tall chain leak fences top of bob wire and heavily signed, they have paid damages for injury and death or trespassing individuals. Case in point was a mine shaft east of Reno, where two hard rock climbers began their climb by climbing over such a fence to access the shaft. While climbing the vertical walls of the shaft, a fall accident occurred, injuring one man and killing the other. The survivor and family of the deceased filed tort claims against the BLM, and the BLM ultimately paid out $750,000 in damages. That's enough money for the team to remediate about 220 hazards. So why is exposure to AMLs es escalating? Two main reasons, urban areas encroaching on mining districts and increasing recreation. Currently, more than 77 million people live in the West and this number is increasing. Of those, more than 27 million live within 25 miles of public lands. As the Arizona State Mine Inspector said, the dangerous shafts and portals of yesterday's mines are now literally in our backyards. This is one of them. This is a mine shaft at uh, Bellevue, Idaho, in the Wood River Valley, just south of Ketchum. This is what it is, a motorcycle and a shaft. The rider, I watched a video actually of this, couldn't pull it up, but rider actually rode up uh, what he didn't know was a waste rock dump right into the shaft, and he actually fell 100 feet without getting seriously injured, which is amazing. He was pretty banged up, but he lived. This one here, Tuella County, Utah. This is a a UTV that was driven into a shaft one evening when this guy was out looking for firewood uh, for their camp just a few miles away. There's the UTV. It got hung up about 20 foot down. He went down 90 foot, once again, lucky to be alive. And this one here is uh, closer to home. Uh, this is about a quarter mile uh, west, southwest of Montana's Capitol building. And that's the dome itself. That's how close it is, right? It's on a ridge uh, just south of uh, uh, Last Chance Gulch, right, between two subdivisions. And this is team member uh, Lonnie Baker, and he's welding up uh, the back frame for the bulkhead because we installed a concrete bulkhead in there, about five foot thick. Uh, Joan Gableman really uh, hated to ask us to do this job because there was hazmat inside there that we won't even discuss here. Um, here's Lonnie though, uh, holding on for dear life to that four inch uh, concrete pumper hose there as he fills up the, the bulkhead with concrete. And we're also asked to, to work in caves at times. This is a CUNA cave uh, near CUNA, Idaho, south of Boise. And strange animals, right? Fall down these shafts. Sometimes they're cattle. Sometimes they're kangaroos in Australia. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was uh, probably about, I think it was 33 feet deep, this shaft. And so they, they shot it with a dart and then safely pulled it to safety. Pretty crazy, huh? So, Public access to mines in the Midwest and East is very restricted because almost all mines are on private land, which are located within a sea of private land, right? The majority of trespassers who visit the mines are young partiers and families wanting to take a summer swim in the cold, deadly water of Quarry Lakes. Though public access is much more restricted than it is uh, to AMLs in the West, the much greater population density back East results in uh, more AML deaths there. The West, with its expansive tracts of public lands, and wide variety of landscapes beckons all types of recreationists to discover its treasures. Whether they're exploring deserts, hunt, hunt or fish, climb alpine peaks, whitewater raft, camp in its forts, or practice rock climbing or tapping a keg underground, millions of Americans from across the nation head to these lands every year to recreate. Uh, Lonnie, the guy you saw welding in the previous photograph there, uh, actually found one of these sites uh, uh, about a week ago uh, out of... Uh, Bellevue, Idaho, Haley, Bellevue, Idaho, <clears throat> big party site. Um, Americans from across the nation heads uh, 
to, the land, to these lands every year to recreate, and doing so, many find themselves intentionally or not in a band of mine lands country. The National Park Service has kept some uh, visita annual visitation records that we can use to get a general sense of recreation levels across all public lands. As you can see, the numbers of those traveling to recreate didn't, recreate, didn't rise significantly until after uh, World War II when um, Americans started to have a little more money in their pockets. The ensuing increase was also amplified by the accompaniment of a cultural shift playing grading, greater value on recreation. Surpassing 250 million visitors in the 1980s is impressive, right? Well, what the National Park Service numbers don't include is the phenomenon born in 1982. Anybody? The ATV. The Suzuki Quad Runner LT125 started a craze that has grown to more than 850 million ATVs and UTVs sold globally every year, with, of course, more being sold in the United States than any other country. Those of us that cut their teeth crawling up abandoned mine roads in an international scout know the cosmic difference between that and doing the same on an ATV or a UTV. One can literally cover five times the ground on one of those OHVs. Relating it back to AML hazards, this means that AML sites rarely visited, even, and even then, uh, only by prospectors, are now seeing staggering numbers of visitors, many of whom are oblivious to the hazards posed to injure or kill them. The stories I could tell you about the people I've met. An example, I was working at an AML site in 2013, over two and a half hours south of Boise near the summit of War Eagle Mountain, which, by the way, is just across the valley from where Integra has recently upped their measured resource at their Delamar, Florida mountain project to a 26 million ounce gold equivalent. As I watched the excavator spinning that sunny Friday morning, <clears throat> I decided to count recreationists using the four-wheel drive trail about 75 feet away from our portal. I quit counting at 2 p.m. after the 110th rider passed by. This is Idaho. Imagine the numbers in California, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada. So most of our work we accomplish on federal lands is authorized through NEPA or CERCLA. Since a BLM is a multiple use land management agency, all potential effects must be considered. These include those to minerals exploration and mining, academic use, mineral specimen collecting, wildlife, culture, et cetera, et cetera. This has resulted in many lockable gates being installed to allow entry for exploration, collecting, and wildlife monitoring, as well as many other things. And longevity and security regarding longevity, uh, when I first started working for the BLM, my, my manager, the late uh, Dave Crosting, he said, Phil, he goes, when you're designing these AML projects, he goes, I don't want you to be thinking 10 to 20 years in the futures, but instead be thinking 1 to 200 years. This means, as with anything else, proven materials and methods must be used. An example being when plugging a shaft with polyurethane foam, we follow findings of a multi-year Colorado School of Mines study that determine the foam density and plug thickness required to have a secure plug. Security. The rule is, if they want in, they'll get in. More on that later. Generally, the greater the security, the more it costs. Depending on the feature location, we employ different levels of security when designing a job. One example is using manganese steel versus mild steel for grates. Though more expensive than mild steel is much more difficult to cut through. First produced by Robert Hadfield in 1892, it contains about 12 to 14 percent manganese, which makes it very, very hard. One of its interesting properties is it gets harder every time it's hit. So when one tries to saw through it, the percussion from the saw blade continually makes it harder. It is used in the manufacture of crusher well wear plates, heavy machinery cutting edges, and the Mexico-US border wall. Remediation commonly used in securing AML physical safety hazards includes grading, backfilling, and polyurethane foam plugs. We install 17 different types of grates, each installed with the client's preference of steel type and dimension and locking feature. The most common type of grate we install is the bat-friendly grate. Bat-friendly grates have a 5 and 3 quarter inch gap between the horizontal bars and a greater than or equal to 24 inch gap between the posts. I'll let you be gazing at this beautiful shot of the Snake River Plain while I continue talking about this. The early debate between zoologists and, and safety personnel uh, was between zoologists not wanting any obstruction at a mine portal or, col or collar and safety personnel wanting a solid barrier. The agreed upon gap allows bats unrestricted ingress egress, but won't allow entry of the average size head of a child. Other specialized features include doorways for the desert tortoise and pipes for snakes. One of the things we do uh, conducting remedi remediation is whenever possible, we leave as many of the historic characteristics of the site intact. 
for future visitors to enjoy and investigate. Faults and or mineralized rock is left exposed in the portal or collar by backfilling or plug plugging to a depth of three to four feet. This allows recreators the opportunity to determine why miners dug where they did and exploration geologists to map and sample the outcrop. If we need to borrow some backfill material from a waste rock dump, we do so in a manner where a planar surface is left that mimics the pre-existing dump's platform. Vandalism. Very little vandalism occurs at rural sites. As one would expect, the closer to a population center, the more vandalism. The array of vandalism was wide, but one of my favorites was at an adit plugged with foam in the Bayhorse Mining District west of Chalice, Idaho. The vandal orderly removed the neatly dry stacked rock wall placed in front of the, the puff, and after cutting a doorway in the wire panel visqueen front bulkhead, they chainsaw a tunnel through the five foot deep foam plug, leaving a colluvium, colluvium bearing foam arch above. They knew what they were doing. Cut through the back bulkhead and Crim de la crim, they attached the cut wire from the bulkheads to the front bulkhead as a hinge door. An impressive attempt uh, of another one, sorry, um, was in the Eureka Mining District south of Kellogg that we heard about earlier, where we installed a manganese steel gate in 2020. This was after the previously installed mild steel gate was breached for the second time. The new gate was made of manganese steel four inch square tubing bars and posts filled with concrete. With a five eighths inch diameter full length stick of manganese steel round placed in the middle of the concrete. Where the vandal had cut through the mild steel with a reciprocating saw more easily, they literally worked for hours trying to breach the new gate, as is evidenced by the multiple dulled and broken saw blades littering the belly and the double jack polished square tubing. It was very uh, a pleasant uh, thing to witness that. A shallow cut in the round was the last moments of their fight before they must have ran out of saw blades and probably physical steam. They would have succeeded if not for the 5 8 inch round and old Hadfield's cocktail of iron, carbon, and manganese. The vandalism of both these AMLs occurred about the same time the ground was staked by the claimant. And interestingly enough, the claimant of record, though these mines were 230 plus miles apart as a crow flies, was one and the same. The most highly respected of all AML vandals, hands down, is the little, little nipper ice spring of the lovers of the dark themselves. They seem to possess the skill sets of a veteran machinist and the uncanny ability to crack any AML barrier they're faced with. If you don't believe us, just let us know and we'll take you on a field trip anytime you'd like to go to the Silver Valley. So, the order of our work is we, we do inventory, remediation, and monitoring, okay? So, <clears throat> we go out and we inventory. Here's uh, one of our employees inventory in a site. And then one of the things that follows soon afterwards usually are bat surveys. This is Rita Dixon of the Idaho Fishing Game. I'm sure many of you in here know her from the bat working group, a leader in white nose syndrome. And this is Jason Corbett, uh, Bat Conservation International. And we have a, a national agreement with uh, BCI where we use them uh, quite often. As a matter of fact, I was just talking to them right before I came in here for another job. And the uh, um, archaeologists. This is the Edelman Mill just northeast of Boise. Um, and you can see there's a wildfire advancing uh, over the ridge to the south of it here. It actually came into the gulch, burned quickly up the gulch, right around the structure that's been standing there for 90, 95 years, something like that, and came within 20 yards of the structure on all sides and didn't burn it down. It, it's a literal miracle, literally a miracle. Um, I mean, you talk about tinder dry, right? Uh, good thing is uh, we're going to be going there uh, first or second week of June this year and doing some stabilization work because this is one of the best preserved uh, mill buildings on BLM in the state of Idaho. Remediation. This is a photo of our piece of equipment of choice, the mini excavator, as you can probably figure out by looking at its tracks in the attic trench that it's occupying. We can get these in and out and they can accomplish of these narrow areas and they can accomplish by far the majority of the work we do. But we do like renting the big ones when we got big prefabricated great panels to set as well. Uh, so, when you're going out to a site uh, to remediate it, you need to get out there. UTV, vehicle of choice, right? Not only for the recreators, but us too. 
They are definitely uh, workhorse vehicles. This job was an addit that they were going to be uh, putting a back grade in. What do you got to do? You got to con confab ahead of time. So you got your field office geologist, this, ge this uh, uh, public affairs officer, officer with a camera in her hands. Uh, uh, she was telling me later, gosh, I, I couldn't have picked a colder day to be on site. And that's true. It got down right above zero on this date. But she, she toughed it out the whole job. And you want to make sure that you check uh, inside and outside of whatever you're working on uh, so you don't uh, have any surprises happen later, like, say, a piece of steel or a rock that you can't go down and into a box of dynamite that's unstable and blows everybody out of the hole. And then you measure your hole for what? Figure out how long your, your steel bars and posts need to be. Then you cut those. Then you weld caps on the end after you slide a piece of hardened cold roll around inside the tubing, right, to make that hand saw work himself to death to try to get through it and then you drill holes in the ribs in the back if it's competent rock as well uh, to set your rock pins that you drive in and then you weld your grate posts to those rock pins as you can see in this photograph and then you start to ladder up your bars usually from the bottom up is the easiest way to do it and you uh, get this uh, in the end if you're good at it right there's not any gap anywhere in this that is greater than what five and three quarter inches right child's head The lead on this project here was uh, Eric Atkins. Uh, all of us uh, that worked with him um, extensively uh, knew him as Foz. Uh, we lost Foz a little over a year and a half ago to a motorcycle accident in South Dakota. He was a great man and uh, an absolute fantastic uh, project superintendent. Here's another site uh, back down to Silver City. We like Silver City in Idaho because it is trampled by people. It reminds me of where I grew up in Colorado outside of Colorado Springs. Um, but as you can see here, the sheriff has, has blocked this road off. Why? Well, you can see that little dark spot out there in the middle of the road, right? Well, there it is on the close-up. This hole uh, is where the waste rock dump, which is you're looking at the face of the waste rock dump there, and you can see it goes down about, about 15 feet until it hits bedrock, right, in the far face there. And then it goes down another 30 feet down and away because what the waste rock dump did when it collapsed, it was going down into a four, four and a half foot wide uh, stope where they mined out the vein at this is what's called the Potosi mine second uh, oldest mine in Silver City I think they collared this shaft in 1864 uh, set set to the tents for placer mining there in 1863 very historic site for the state of Idaho um, anyway uh, and so uh, you can see you were looking right down on strike there and behind the the dug fur and the the upper center of the photograph uh, just behind it to its left or right, you can barely see the waste rock dump on the other side of town, which is the Morningstar mine. And this uh, vein went all the way across there, and they mined the entire thing out under town and everything. Of course, coming up right up to the roots in town. And in town, you got your Silver City Hotel. Well, it's actually fallen uh, into uh, the same uh, stope as the stope collapses as well. They're spending a lot of money trying to hold that building up, even though there's not any um, uh, uh, year long, year round. Um, People that live there, there are people that live there in the summer, and people come up to recreate there from Boise, and they like the strawberry rhubarb pie in the hotel. At least that's what I've heard anyway. Um, anyway, yeah, so here we are. First thing we do, we're excavating it out, right, to be able to figure out what we got to do here, laying it back in this loose rock to OSHA standards, so we had to move quite a bit of material. And here it is, almost completely excavated. This is looking on strike back to the north. Here it is looking on strike back to the south, and you can see where we've excavated down inside of that stope to a depth to where we're going to be matching that Colorado School of Mines formula, right, to where we can make sure we have a secure plug. And you can see at the top uh, of the photograph there, a back grade culvert in an adit. That's an extension of the same uh, working uh, which or, or uh, vein, anyway, that's been mined out, which goes up and over the hill and beyond. And here is the puff job where it's almost done, looking back to the north. And now here, after 124 cubic yards of puff uh, being in place, uh, it, we're done with the puffing. And what do you do? You backfill it. And we reestablish the road track um, to try to keep people going just where we want them instead of left and right. Looking back along strike to the south and to the north. Now it's safe. This is the Con Virginia mine out in Oregon, out of Baker City. Uh, we did, recently did a number of mines, uh, pardon me, a number of mines for uh, the Baker field office out there uh, for the BLM. Um, some of them uh, quite close uh, 
to the, <clears throat> pardon me, quite close to the uh, Oregon Trail Visitor Center. Anyway, uh, this is Lonnie Baker. Uh, he, you can tell that some of these uh, jobs get a, a little uh, um, extensive and how we have to get materials up the hill. We weren't allowed to go up the hill here because of sage grouse concerns uh, with any type of equipment or vehicles. And so we had to set up our, our pulley system. And, and you can see where Lonnie has just set the, the main girder in the hole uh, using that system. And now he has driven a, a, a rock, uh, set of rock pin in the east end of it and he's welding it to that rock pin there. And next morning, bright and early, he's there doing the same thing on the west side. And then there's his finished product. Silver City again. This trail here uh, is trampled literally by hundreds of people uh, every weekend in the summer. Um, and, uh, oops. Um, and there was four holes along this, three stopes and, a sh no, five. Three stopes, a shaft, and an adit, right? Um, anyway, I'm going to come back here. Yeah. Okay. So, so you can see, I think that's me actually peering into the hole. Um, that's this back to this one picture that I showed earlier. And, uh, here's the, the boys finishing up, uh, the welding on the grate they installed over it. They wanted to make it look like the, the, the mining camp that it is. And so they made this, they oriented the bars in this direction. So it looked like a grizzly. Here's a view underneath the grate of the stoat which, by the way, an octogenarian there, Mary O'Malley, says, imagine how many 10-year-old boys are down that. <laughs> Here's for you looking back at the uh, Our Lady of Tears uh, Catholic Church where they steer, still hold math, uh, ma Mass once a month. And then here is uh, an adit that intersects uh, the uh, drift uh, just, just beyond what we just looked at. Oh, I think I got some auto. And there's a uh, back great culvert we put in that, and you can see the proximity of that in relation to the church building. Uh, here is uh, an adit in the Bayhorse Mining District uh, that we puffed. You can see the front bulkhead there. Here's a close-up where the last bag of puff was poured in. Here's what it looks like afterwards after stacking the rocks and making it look like that the opening never occurred for the last 50 years anyway. And here is installing a back great culvert. First, you excavate the portal, set the culvert, and there it is backfilled. Can you tell that he gave me the five-minute sign a minute ago? <laughs> And here is all said and done. This is the last chance mine. It's about the for, the, for those of you that have been following rare earths uh, in the salmon area. Um, it was the uh, about the furthest west of any of exploration uh, through the 1980s uh, for that, other than a few uh, dozer cuts up uh, uh, McDevitt Creek for you guys that are familiar with that area. The Culverts and Bats debate. The debate was... There was a segment of the wildlife biologist community that was saying when we started using culverts that bats cannot echo, echo locate in a metal culvert. They're never going to use them. Well, we documented their use, okay? And, I mean, if you look at this, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bats flying out of this bat great culvert, right? This is near Letter, Idaho. So if anybody ever tells you that, you just call me. I'll give you this photograph. It's funny that. It's like the face on one a couple of those bats looks a lot like the salmon field office assistant manager. Uh, and they're ravenous little bastards. Um, <clears throat> we do have failures. This is a job that I was helping the Idaho Department of Lands out with. They'd formed a, an AML team to go do this kind of stuff. I said, oh, yeah, I just put a culvert in there and put a puff collar around it. They did. It failed. You can see the little remnants of the puff, uh, the yellow material in the bottom right there where the hole goes underneath it. And you can, the reason it failed is because the loose on consolidated material that the miners made for the level service area around the collar, which you can see the contact about halfway down the right-hand side of the photograph of that with the glacial till. Okay, and then first spring, they get tons of snow up there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> down she went. Oh, and that, I just wanted to show you this picture of the owner of that mine, the afterthought mine there. This is Mick. He's also a farmer. And for those of you out there suffering uh, from atrial fibrillation, or if you know anybody, be sure to have him contact Mick, because what he did, he was working on his big hog pump that pumps his water up out of the Snake River up to irrigate his field. And he damn near killed himself, getting shocked, right? Yeah, he had a pacemaker and everything for, for AFib. They even took the pacemaker out. He hadn't had a problem since. I highly recommend that method. And then just closer to home, a lot of us have seen this photograph, but this is like an annual occurrence in Butte, if not more often than that, of a big giant mine. 
that collapsed right next to a house. There's a story that goes along with that as well. But, so what do we got? We got a future full of holes. So many sites, so little time, right? The BLM sites depicted on this map represent almost 105,000 features on BLM alone. And I think that doesn't include the estimated 390,000 sites not included in government uh, databases. So lessons learned. I'm 62 years old, okay? Been doing this for a long time. What it boiled down to uh, for me is never make a dirt moving bet with a mountain moving contractor, okay? Strange things can happen, all right? <laughs> all right, any questions? <laughs>